how you dress, everything. How you dress. Is that adding or subtracting? How you walk in, is it adding or subtracting? The comments you make, are you adding or you subtracting? The notes you take, are you adding or you subtracting? This is the mindset we got to have. So if we want to be a big organization that has a ton of people coming through the doors and we actually keep those people and it's not a revolving door, we have to have these things in mind, right? Every single person has to take personal responsibility for what they are contributing to the meeting. And hopefully it's, we're adding something. So you got to remember that it's everyone here is a piece of the puzzle. It's not about well, I'm small or I'm only one person or I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't do anything. I'm just sitting in. No, it's all, it all adds up. Because when somebody walks in and they, they're they going to, if they see something in the environment, that's going to affect who they are. They're going to say, oh, people come late. I can come late too because I usually come late and I see people coming late, so I'll come late. Or people are being negative. I'm a negative person, so that's how, that's how I'm going to behave. But we have to create an environment where people come in and they make rapid, dramatic changes and then they can become successful here. Does that make sense? And one of the things, man, that's getting worse and worse is people coming late, you know, Saturday training tomorrow. Talk to talk to people about that. Are you being a leader or are you just saying show up? A leader is going to say, right, how mad do you get when people come late? It's, it's absolutely unacceptable to her. With your team, for yourself, is it unacceptable? I mean, how, how successful is someone going to be if we can't even get them to discipline themselves? As a leader, you help to create discipline in others. If you can't discipline yourself, how can these are basic things? But it's the environment is, you know, it's very fragile, guys. And we got to get good at being small. I mean, we're not super small as an organization. Um, I, I was checking Shaq's income. A lot of the got celebrities in the company. I mean, he's right there dollar for dollar with him. This is not a small organization, but we're not where we need to be. We want to be a million dollar organization. But one of the sayings that we have is that we got to be we got to be good at being small before we're good at being big. Does that make sense? So uh, I'm going to open up doing a securities training. Um, this is a really good presentation that uh, financial advisors are using with their clients. I learned it from somebody else, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, but I'll be doing it over and over again. That's how I get good, right? I want to do it in front of you guys to teach you, but also the more times I do it, the better it's going to sound when I'm in front of a real client, okay? So what happens when we are when we are out there and we're sitting with clients, um, and even before we sit with clients, let's say that we just simply meet somebody, right? And they ask, what do we do? I know there's a million different <laughs> answers, right? Hector says, I help people build their own financial services businesses. I don't know if a lot of people are here saying that. You know, Maybe you say that I'm in financial services. Maybe you say that I help people reach their financial goals, whatever. But sometimes you may mention if you're a securities license, we help people with investments. We help people with retirement. Now, when you just go out and say that, right? So Sophia probably gets this. You know, when, when you tell someone that you do investments and they're not your client yet and you haven't tried to set an appointment, in general, what usually comes up when you say that you're an investment? What do they ask? Like the profit. Just in general, just talking. Oh, so yeah. So you, so you say, yeah, I, uh, retirement investments. I help people with their portfolios, right? What is it that, what are, what are some of the follow-up questions you get from people in a general sense? Right. I mean, that's just like what kind. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm trying to think That's about okay. No, no, I mean, you know, who, 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 get, who, who gets some follow-up questions? Big stocks. You big stocks? Taxes. Where's the Dow? What companies do I like? Sometimes they ask about that. So, huh? Okay, so I like this direction. So what's a follow-up to that? Why would it be stressful? Is it risky? What are you saying? Usually they're going to ask, what do you think is going to happen? Okay, right? Isn't that true? Because the market is so volatile and we've seen, and now it's at a high, 
that everyone's kind of being, it's one of those times where, you know, if the chart just looks like this, everyone's waiting for that bottom. Now, since 2008, I think that there's so much information um, and people follow it on a daily basis that people are trying to stay ahead of that of that downturn, right? So if I, especially where I live and the people that are just around me, if I mention investments, um, and even with my own dad, he has a he has a sizable amount of money. I mean, the first question is, what do you think is going to happen? Now, does anybody know what's going to happen? Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. You can tell a little story, you can say little things, but you don't really know what's going to happen. And that's one of the things that people want to know. So, what what the response? I'm going to show you a presentation where you can respond to somebody, and then when you actually sit down with them, you can you can show them what you would do or or what you're doing for your client. So. If someone says, well, what do you think is going to happen, right? I would say, well, the world is a crazy place right now. And so what I'm doing is I'm sitting with a lot of my clients and I am doing a stress test on their portfolio. So when you go to a doctor, you do a stress test. And a stress test is... When the doctor intentionally puts you under not a ton of stress, but a mild amount of stress, because they want to see the, the possible outcomes that you are going to have from going through that stress. So the reason I'm doing this is because in, in 2008, a lot of my clients, they did exactly what I told them to do. Their money went down. They didn't take money out. They actually put more money in. Now they've benefited from that tremendously in the last 10 years. But a lot of people, they can't go through that again. So I'm meeting with people and I am I'm doing a stress test. Okay. Now, when you think about a stress test in a portfolio, what are the different things that can potentially happen that cause stress to a portfolio? Maybe there could be, and I'll write these up here, a major geopolitical event. There could be a financial crisis. We can see a change in interest rates. And then on top of that, we have all these major things that are that are affecting our world and our and then our investments. But then simultaneously, we invest at a high and we're forced to withdraw when the market is down. So, Mr. and Mrs. Klein, would you agree that these are the major things that can happen to a portfolio? A major geopolitical event, financial crisis, a change in interest rates. And then on top of all of that, we make things worse because maybe we invested at a high and then we were withdrawing at a low or when the market is down. So let's say that we take our money and we put it in an index fund. So can you bring up the hypothetical that shows the S&P 500? So let's say that we are in index funds, ETFs, which ETFs are also a form of an index fund. It's just traded a little bit different. It has different tax advantages, but it's a passive management or no management strategy. So if we put money into the S&P 500, let's say that we take a million dollars and we stick it in the year 2000. So this is a good amount of years, the 20 year period. We take our million dollars and we put it in and now we're going into retirement and we are withdrawing right around 4%, which is what's advisable. So we don't completely withdraw all of our money, right? 
We want the money to last. And what we'll do is we'll give ourselves a 3% raise for standard of living annually. So in the beginning, it's 40 grand, right? And then you can see the withdrawals. This is the S&P 500. You can see the withdrawals are progressively going up. So we put in a million dollars. Now, let's look at the different events that happened since 2000. Dante, what happened in 2001? Uh, I would say 2001 was 9-11, right? So is that a major geopolitical event? Yeah. Absolutely. Now in 2002, what happened, Dante? That one. that one was the tech bubble. So in 2002, there was a tech bubble, and simultaneously, Arthur Anderson, which was the largest accounting firm, they, they did the auditing for the all of the big S&P 500 companies, they went under. So things got really shaken up in, in 2002. Now, a lot of people don't remember when I was in, and I remember this, I was in Primerica and we were doing mortgages at the time. Right now, what's the, what's the, you, you know, you were in mortgages, Amanda. What, what, if you, what's a good interest rate right now on a mortgage? Four, right? When we used to do a smart loan, some of our interest rates were six, seven, eight percent on a smart loan. So what people don't remember is that between 2004 and 2006, interest rates went up by four. Imagine today if the interest rates went up by four. So we got 9-11. We got the biggest accounting firm going down. We got the tech bubble. We got interest rates going up like crazy. And then a few years later, in 2008, the number one largest insurance company in the world defaults, AIG. Major U.S. banks default. Major financial crisis. All the big mortgage companies default. Even bonds, investment-grade bonds, AAA bonds are defaulting. And we go through all of that. Now, if we look at 2000, right, late 90s was major momentum in the market. So couldn't we assume that, and looking back, we almost know that investing in, the, in exactly the year 2000 was at a high. And now we go through 2002, but we have to retire, right? And we're taking money out, even though the market has gone down. Look at this, Mr. and Mrs. Client. Two, three years in, in the S&P 500, your money's from a million down to 500,000. This stress test is failing. Now, when we look at it, at the end of the 20-year period, because now we've had a 10-year run in the market, we put in a million in the S&P 500. We withdrew a million. But after 20 years in retirement, we're already down to 300,000. This is a failed stress test. Now, let's go to our American funds portfolio. So we devised this portfolio to withstand these types of market conditions. And let's say that we invest the money, because I know you guys are going to ask. <clears throat> 30% American balance fund, 30% American mutual fund, and 30% capital in income builder. And then we are going to, actually, this is out of order, sorry. 30% American Balance Fund, 30% Capital Income Builder, 30% Income Fund of America. And then for liquidity and to add a little bit of growth, right, we are going to put in 5%, the remaining 10% difference, 5% American Mutual and 5% U.S. government securities. And that's for liquidity. So 30, 30, 30, 5 and 5, that adds up to 100. Let's see how this performed, these American funds. So same year, 2000, we put in a million dollars. Now, you can see in the same column here, whereas the S&P 500 was left with half a million, our portfolio has a million dollars still, even after withdrawals. The withdrawals are the exact same. At the end, I put in a million. I withdraw a million, just like the S&P. But today, I have 1.8 million. Right? So this is a successful stress test. So let's go back in, and that is that is the whole thing. So let's go back and talk about this. Number one, how do we, when we're prospecting, 
because this is the actual presentation, right? At some point, you have to set the meeting. You don't do all this when you're actually talking to someone standing up. So you got to be really careful, especially when you are talking to people, um, certain types of people. You don't want to seem like you're leaning one way or the other politically. So can we agree that when we say, well, the world's a, a crazy place right now, right? I could be leaning right. I can be leaning left. I can be talking about a lot of different things that I'm not specifying. But either way, you're going to get a head nod. Right? And then when you get to a certain you know, age of clientele, they understand stress tests. To be honest, I didn't even know what a stress test was. I've never had a stress test. But what do they do in a stress test? Does anybody know? Okay, so they put you on a treadmill. So they get your, they get your heart rate up maybe, right? And then they see how you respond. So I think that that's going to, that's going to resonate as well. And then... Here, we're basically talking about the major things that can happen in the world. Isn't that true? So a major geopolitical event, that's going to be 9-11. After that, everything, everything pretty much changed. The financial crisis. Now, as a, as a young person, you know, can you say, can Josh say, yeah, in 2008, man, my client, no, obviously he can't say that. <laughs> five years later, right? So you got you to change some of the some of the language there, right? You got to change some of the language there so that it can fit you. But it's okay. Even if you didn't live through these times or, or you were in the business during these times, as a studier of the market, studier of financial services, Caleb can know the dates. Does that make sense? He can't say that I went through it or my clients went through it, but he can say that this is something that I've read about, I've researched, ex ex researched extensively. And you can kind of remind them, right? Again, in the financial crisis, I'll just put the dates up here just so we can, you guys can put this in your notes. But, you know, 2001 was the major geopolitical event. That was 9-11. Um, the financial crisis, this is 2002. And then you have the tech bubble. And then you have Arthur Anderson. Change in interest rates, that was 2004 to 2006, where the interest rates went up. By 4%. They didn't go to 4%. They went up by 4%. And then investing at a high because the market was at a high at 2000 because the tech bubble had uh, drove it up to that. And then withdrawn when the market, when the money was down, right? So after 2002 and after 2008, you still have to survive and you still have to retire, right? So you still have to withdraw money. So I've been kind of looking into um, the, the different American funds and figuring out how to explain them and, and what makes things different. But um, it's, what it really comes down to with American funds is it's, it's, we got to talk about the research that they do. So one of the companies that if we go to, do you have access to Yahoo Finance? Okay, so if we go to Yahoo Finance or you go on your iPhone or whatever, right, put in GE. GE is a company, I think, that's been around since the 1800s. Maybe even before that, I don't know. Um, look, at, look at what's happened in the last five years to GE. The so GE was a blue chip stock. I think for a while they were on a run for, I don't know, 50, 60 years straight of tank dividends. Um, so blue chip company, right? And it was uh, obviously a major component in the S&P 500. Was it in the Dow? I'm not sure. It might have been. I'm not sure. But um, GE in the last, like, let's look at the last year. Right? You can see that it took a, it took a major dip. So one of the things that American Funds prides itself in is they don't research from afar. What they do is if anything happens with 
if they anticipate anything with the company, they go and they meet with the CEO and they go and they look at the books and they do their research and they send their analysts, right? So the analysts go there. There's hundreds of analysts in American funds and they go there and then they wrote, report back to the portfolio managers. Well, right around at this time here, which is about a year ago, they figured out that they couldn't see how GE could turn a profit. They just, they couldn't see how it could turn a profit the next quarter. And they didn't like the way that things were going. I mean, this is a major, major move to sell that out of a portfolio. And uh, they sold this out of, uh, from what I remember, AMCAP, which is one of, uh, you know, a top American fund. They sold it out of this. And this is what they prevented. Okay. Now, if you are, if you have an index fund, an S&P 500 fund, right? In the S&P 500, 500 largest publicly traded companies. And you have a company in there where this is going to happen because it's not managed. There's no, there's no person that can pull the plug. There's no person that can take it out of the portfolio. What has to happen is the company has to get small enough to fall out of the S&P. And while it's falling, what's it doing in your portfolio, Matt? Right. It's dragging down your portfolio because you can't sell it out of the S&P 500. It has to be disqualified from being in the S&P 500. Does that make sense? And these are the different arguments and stories that we use to sort of show people the importance of active versus passive management. ETF is passive management. Index funds is passive management. People believe that if I just if I if I pick a criteria and I stick all the companies that fit that criteria in a basket with no management, no human being, that will outperform an actively managed fund. That is not true for American funds. American funds outperforms the index consistently. There's a stat that they put out there, um, and they say that. Ninety percent of funds. Will not beat the index. Well, I've heard that there's nine thousand funds. Ninety percent of them don't beat the index. OK, right. But that means that 10 percent still does. That leaves you nine hundred choices where you can do better than an index. We also showed you in that indexing strategy when a client puts in money and they're withdrawing money and it goes through, the market goes through what it goes through, you're left with 300 versus 1.8. Um, I'll give you guys some fun recommendations right now. I know that people always ask this. For a more conservative client or for somebody that is taking money out of a bank account to invest in the market, which I don't recommend often. Um, one of the things that we can do to make a portfolio more conservative, but not, you know, it's not in literally cash, right? Or if somebody is uh, a little bit older or very conservative in nature, we can use the balance. Um, I think this has like a 45 year history and it's gone down five out of 45 times, right? So out of 45 years, it's only gone down five times. You want to be able to say that to a client. The balance fund, um, go up real quick. Actually, yeah, we can look at this. Let's go down. Okay, so portfolio event every, uh, for every investor, this will show if we go down to here, this is a, it has a 10 year of about 10%. So as a conservative fund, it's averaging 10% on the 10 year. This is an interesting stat that you can use for the balance fund and why you're a proponent of it. Because the balance fund mandates that a minimum of 50% needs to be in stocks up to a maximum of 75%. So if they have the flexibility of actually fluctuating 
cash and bonds at those percentage rates. Why is this important? Because a couple of years ago when the market was rallying, they were at 74% stocks. So it's catching that upside of the market. You're seeing that growth in your portfolio, in your fund. Last quarter of last year, October, November, December of 2018, the market as a whole went down 14%. People thought that was the start of the recession. Balance fund in that same quarter only went down six. Reason being was because at that point in time, only 52% was in stocks. So the managers can prepare, they can anticipate certain things based on the research, and this is what is going to hold up the portfolio. Now, Caleb, does that mean that it didn't go down at all? No, but it captured less than half of the downturn because of the way that the, that that fund functions. Who has questions about this? Is that too complex? I would, yeah, that's a, I mean, to some, someone above the age of 55, that is an awesome portfolio to be putting in. And I think that Sophia's talked about that with Howard Lashley, right? Like that's what the American, the balance, capital income builder and income fund of America, that trio, yes, that is an awesome portfolio to give someone who's a little bit in the on the other end, you know, not in 30s, 40s, but maybe later 50s and beyond, definitely someone who's withdrawing money. Um, but then they took an extra 10% and sliced it into two different funds. But yeah, that trio is, is, is pretty good. Yeah. What else? Any other securities questions? That? Anything else, Shaq? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't have the exact, usually what, what's going to happen is if someone says, you know, I, hey, I'm doing a lot of stress tests on my clients. I don't, my clients have been through 2008, but they just they just can't do that again. So I'm meeting with everyone and I'm, doing, I'm putting their funds through, you know, their portfolios through a stress test or if someone is, maybe hasn't done that yet, they want to sit down and they want to go over that. Usually that'll elicit a response from the client. You know, like, oh, yeah, maybe that's something that I should do or how do you do that? Well, why don't we sit down? We can sit down for 20 minutes. I can prepare something and, you know, we can take a look at it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I sat down with, not sat down with, I was just sitting at a table with a guy who owns, a, you know, multiple companies, very wealthy in my building. And he was telling me that his Merrill Lynch guy, he's in all ETFs and index funds. So I didn't know this at the time. But next time we sit down and he happens to be there, I can just show him something mm -hmm. like this. Right? But just make it very casual. Don't say, hey, let's do a kitchen table meeting for 45 minutes to an hour. Right? Just, just say, hey, yeah, let's meet up and I can, I can show you what I'm showing my clients. It could be helpful for you, the information, if it, you, know, you could benefit from it. And we can see how yours performs through that. But um, they're saying that that presentation right there is was given by the number one wholesaler in all of American funds. Wow. American funds is number one. And the territory that he's in, everyone who's learned this, they're doing record numbers of million dollar investments into this portfolio. People that have never done a million are doing a million because of this. I didn't wow. want to make this up. So that's what you just heard. It's going to be on video. Use it. Uh, very easy. Two different hypotheticals. He has it now on the cloud. So hopefully that's all. All right, Rick Jack. All right, Rick Jack. Vaseline on your chest. Or something. <laughs> 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 the wax. Or... <laughs> 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 
I'm hairless. So. All right. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Great. Great. Right. Learn. Samir was sharing some of that stuff with me over the last couple of weeks. All right. Um, so tomorrow, let's you know go over some of the things we have going on. Tomorrow is Super Saturday, so uh, you know I'll, I'll notify the people that will be uh, helping us tomorrow uh, with training. People that had a successful month last month or did something uh, worthy of them sharing with the group. Uh, obviously, um. Rest up, rest of your uniform, great attitude. Uh, June has already started, but uh, we will continue the momentum in June. We'll get ready for our convention. We have uh, Super Monday on Monday, 10 o'clock. Christian David's office, 364. Sweet A, Christopher Avenue, Gaithersburg, Maryland. All right. Uh, and then Tuesday night, we have Opportunity Night here, our monthly Opportunity Night here in Kearney. People are that will be participating. I know a couple of people texted me. Um, you know, is it okay if we come? Absolutely. If you want to come and want to see the bigger, you know, get a bigger picture, environment, whatever it is, bring guests here. Um, for whatever reason that you want to do it, absolutely. You can come uh, on Tuesday. We start at 7.30. Uh, dress formal. Look your best. Okay? Not, you know, like we do on Fridays or Saturdays, all right? This is, I want a different tone set uh, on Tuesday night, okay? Uh, and we will have some food, we will have some refreshments, uh, you know, light food, light refreshments. And then after Tuesday night, I'm confirming uh, for the people that qualify for the Lake Whittle conference call or the uh, Zoom call, we'll be doing that on Tuesday night, by the way. I'll look through the, the, uh, the requirements on the, the Telegram. I think it was one by 1,000. One of the months. Okay, so I will get that out to you guys. And Tuesday night afterwards, we'll do a evening Zoom call. Okay, uh, with Blake. All right, for the people that qualify. All right, so let's get um, started with our training here. And... You know, for all intensive purposes, uh, right now we're about the halfway mark for you. It's not really July. For, for us, in our fiscal year, it's June. Okay. So, the awesome thing about Primerica is, you know, you, you can break it up in more miniature pieces and, and uh, evaluate your performance this year. And you have to be, and I talk about this all the time, very honest with yourself about what you've done and what you, you know, where you've kind of fallen off. Not to the point where it's detrimental, because you want to keep it productive. Okay, I don't want you leaving the meeting and trying to kill yourself. Okay? That's <laughs> not the goal. All right. But if you don't make some fundamental changes, nothing's going to happen. And for the Friday meeting, okay, and always remember this. If in order for you to grow your business, you have to grow your Friday meeting. Okay? You have to grow all of your meetings, but people that don't come to Fridays, they don't get big here. That's just the reality. Okay. So I know it's Friday. I know it's the morning. I know it's, you know, you know, sometimes you got to run a crazy schedule to get here, but you're here. You have a shot. And so if you, you look at your meeting, if it's not growing, if there's not new people, right? Hey, look, my Friday, and I'm not saying this because of me, it's growing and I'm excited. In totality, it's growing and my base shop is growing and the base shop is really the only thing I can control. But if your Friday meeting is not growing, you're not making the right ask. You're not recruiting the right type of people. You're not recruiting enough people. All right, are we good? No, you're fine. So today, and like all Fridays, we're going to talk about, you know, activity, 
prospecting, schedule, making money, setting goals, okay? Uh, I know sometimes we do product training, but the purpose of Friday is to get you to understand how to be a full-timer. Because once you're full-time, man, and you can be successful, you can train other people, and you got a handful of successful full-timers, you can do some damage in Fred Merrick. All right? And, you know, I mean, this is a money machine. It's a freaking cash cow, man. Right? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how much money's in this business. It's crazy. All right? So, let's talk about some numbers. Okay? So, obviously, you have to, you have to set a big goal. Small, small goals don't do anything for anybody. All right? So, I'm about setting big goals. I am about that. Okay? I think that, and, and, and for you, okay, me, I have never, ever, ever hit a big goal on time. Ever. Not one time. Okay? So every single goal, the ring, I was late. 200,000, I was late. 300,000, I was late. 400,000, I was late. 500,000, way late. Okay? <laughs> I mean it. I, I know you feel sorry for me. I've been 400,000 for four years, right? I'm mean, oh like, damn, God. geez, ah, ah, right? <laughs> no, but... You have a goal, you set it, you set a big goal, you're never going to get there. 100 people showing up to do a meeting, late. $30,000 base shop, late. Still haven't done the $100,000 base shop, right? Late. It's okay. I'm not, I'm, now, but you got to set a big goal, but then you got to understand how to hit your goal. Okay? Because setting a goal that's, you know, I, I always talk about this. One of my favorite movies is The Departed. Anybody seen The Departed? Seen that movie? You ever seen The Departed? Who has seen The Departed? Okay, great movie. Great movie. Love the movie. Okay, it's an awesome movie. Okay, so if you haven't seen the movie, you won't understand this scene and will not make sense to you at all. Okay, but if you've seen it, you may. Okay, so Leonardo DiCaprio is in the office with... Martin Sheen and Mark Wahlberg, and he's trying to become an undercover policeman. And he goes, are you a cop? Or are you trying to pretend to be a cop? And he doesn't understand the question. He's like, I'm applying to be a police officer. I don't know what you mean. He's like, no, it's a valid question. Are you a cop? Or are you trying to appear to be a cop? See? Many of you, okay, and this is a valid point. I'm not trying to cast judgment. You appear to be full-time, but you're not full-time. Like, you know what to say. You, you even know the, the dirty talk on the goal. Look. All right, Josh, you got it down. Oh, look. Five directs, right? Okay, okay, yeah. 10,000 personal. This is the month. Yes. 20 by 20, do or die. 30, 30. You're appearing to be a cop. Right? It's cool to set the goals, right? Mike Sharp said it in, in one of my favorite eyes. Like, you'll set a goal so you already can pat you on the back. Awesome, man. Go get it. No, no, no. That, you're appearing to be a cop. Okay? You're, not, you're not trying to be a full-timer. You have no... Right. And it's OK. You got to put yourself out there right, a little bit right now. Right. Like who, had, who, who, who knows their goal for the month? I mean, Josh is just too easy. So I don't want to call him. <laughs> huh? <clears throat> What's your goal for the month? 30 by 30. 30. OK. And, I, and, and, and listen, you know, they always say. Belichick always gets on Brady in practice because if he gets on Brady, he can get on everybody else. Right? Like he intentionally gets on Brady. So I'm about to do that right now. Okay? Because I want you to know she put herself out there. I actually knew what she was going to say. And I prepared this training for her. <laughs> I really did. Okay? But it's it, it, it's an app. Matt, what, what's your goal? Be careful what you say. I know what you were going to say before you were going to say. What are you going to say? 10 by 10. I knew it, right? And I knew she was going to say 30 by 30 because those are the numbers, right? Like for me, that's dirty talk. Like that is a not safe for work text. Okay. You send me 30 by 30. It's like, 
<laughs> I'm having a Primerica there. Oh okay? That, those numbers is just, it's so good. Right? 30, 30, <laughs> right? It's just, that's it, right? So, okay, set a big goal. It's a nice number. You can hit it. You definitely can hit it, okay? You've done it before, okay? You have not done that before, but you can hit it. If you did three months ago, you did 26,000. But how is this goal going to work? How? How? What are the numbers? For, okay, we'll use your goal. It's a little smaller than 30, 34. I'll ask you, Jen. 10 by 10. How are you going to hit that? Man? How is that number going to happen? Okay. Okay. And how are you going to do that? Okay. Okay. So, so I heard some good numbers there. Okay. Numbers that you could write down and think about, right? Because like the worst thing here is you, if you're here, and you do actually want to do this business. You don't know where to start. You, you know, always remember change always happens in the mind first. Okay. Never, ever, ever, ever forget that. All right. And, and I came to Primerica because of transformation. That's why I came here. Money's part of it because I wanted to survive. I wanted to get married one day. I want to have kids and money was a big thing, but the deeper Thing that resonated with me was transformation. I wanted to change my life, man. I really did. I wanted, I wanted more. I wanted all of it. I came, I came here for the whole freaking buffet, and that started with change my life. I did not feel great about where I was, so it happens in the mind. So if I see you guys as kind of wandering people that don't know what to do, right? And I feel, I, I still feel there's a pulse in there that I can awaken you, but you got to work towards something, right? So if I see, okay, you said um, 10 interviews a week, okay, I'll just say 10 guests a week, is that right? <coughs> that was one of the things you said, five appointments a week, done, completed, right? Because there are building blocks in our business, okay? The first building block is getting on the board. Okay, you have to never accept zero. You can never do zero. Ever. That means you have become a productive person in Primerica. Then there's building blocks. There's three by three. There's five by five. There's 10 by 10. There's 20 by 20. There's 30 by 30. Right. And while these numbers are just numbers in numerical order, you've got to understand how to hit them. You're a surgeon here, man. You got to know what to do. So for me, right, like if I was going to tell Matt or Jen, if Jen says 30 by 30, Jen knows. Okay, she can say the number, right? Then I'm going to look up at my thread and say, and I and I can monitor Jen there because she is super transparent. Like all people on my top producer list, they're very transparent, okay? I know what they did in the last week, personal and team. I know how many appointments they have set on Sunday night. It is impossible to do 30 by 30 if you have 11, 12, 13 appointments set for the week. So 10 by 10 sounds great. And I think you could even do the recruits. But if you set three appointments a week, set four appointments a week, set five appointments set a week, it's it. You will never do that. And now you're just freaking, you know, a, a little troll just walking around. Just, hey, I'm going to set these numbers and I'm appearing to be a cop. You're never going to hit that goal. You're never going to hit that goal. And I'm not talking about never hitting the goal like me being late to a goal. That's different. You are literally in the twilight zone, the full timer twilight zone. That's not going to happen. You have to. Have 10 appointments set a week. I mean, and it's you got to be freaking obsessed or else you're not going to grow your income. You're not going to grow your production. You think you might, but you won't. You won't. I know it. And you definitely will not have a consistent growth pattern, income pattern, whatever, whatever you want to call it. You can get a trade. You can get a, a, a big 
earns check. You can do something. You know, you can recover something. That's absolutely true. But this is about consistency. And consistency happens with consistent activity and understanding the building blocks on how to do it. You got you, you just got to understand it, right? So how do you work backwards from a goal? Okay, there's two ways that you can do it. Okay, and we'll talk about the production first. Okay. So, if Regina, you say you want to have, you want to do 5,000, okay, which is about five sales. Maybe less, maybe more. Okay. What's the number? Okay. That's that's still a result. Five appointments set, okay, a week. What is another number for production? Oh, well, you know it? You know what production is, though. Not even hang with job. What is it? What's the number? Five people showing up. Usually, the amount of people you have showing up to training is the number of sales you'll do per month. Okay. So if Jenny has anywhere from around, we'll call it 20, right? So you can go to 30, but if you want to get to 30, stay at 30, you got to get and stay at 30. Or have appointments set per week. And that's okay. I don't care how you do it, right? I mean, there are a lot of organizations that are smaller than mine that, that are more productive than me. Why? They set more appointments on a weekly basis. There are a lot of organizations, not a lot, but there are probably a handful of organizations that are bigger than mine. I'm talking at my level. And we're more productive because we set more appointments per week, right? But on average, if you grow the amount of appointments set per week and your attendance, You will grow your production, which means what? You'll grow your income. So when we call, okay, as, as uncomfortable and as, as annoying as it is, when we call and we have people stand up for appointments, I already know what you're going to do. Man. I already know. I don't need to. I, I know to a science. I have the system built for you. It's built for you. And, and you guys know me. If, if Shay knows 100%. Okay. If, if something goes off and I don't see it in the week, I'll give her a call. I'll be like, hey, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm just investigating. I'm not attacking. I'm not accusing. I'm not coming. This is what we do. This is our business. This is money. Shay, I noticed you guys set 30 appointments and she'll tell me, hey, four, four apps went in COD. Okay. That's all I need to know. I just want to know, make sure our system's not broke. They say, hey, man, you know what? I was in the wrong market. I got freaking duped. I went out. Didn't you tell me that many times? Because I call her all the time, right? See, it's not like, you know, when, when things are happening, you talk to people that are doing what they should be doing, right? So you talk and say, hey, what happened? What about this? What about that? Oh, okay. And then I can see how to get better, how to improve. So the numbers can become more predictable because unpredictable, unpredictability, write this down. equals permanent frustration. And that's why people can't handle themselves in a commission type performance type work without a salary. But you can take that out of it if you do the work. And so that's why you gotta be freaking crazy tomorrow when you're setting appointments. And I'll, I'll go into, I mean, this is not, this is a money, this is, this is under, you know, understanding the money game here at Prime right? So on the recruits, 
Okay. Here are the recruiting numbers. Okay. Here are the recruiting numbers. What numbers have we heard for recruits? Um, four. Yes, sure. one. Right, one out of four. I do one out of three. Shondell put one out of three. She did do one out of three. That that's for most of us. That's not going to be accurate. Okay, it's just not. Okay, you know, after doing it for a long time and really grooving, yes, maybe. But usually, hey, look, these are these are bulletproof numbers. One out of four. You know, so you got to get the guests in. You got to have a lot of meetings, right? Now, if you're at the kitchen table and you have 10 clients and they're 50% recruited, which I believe that, well, then, yes, if you invite clients out, you can do it. But normal people, you meet, three friend of a friend, I know a guy who knows a guy, all the stuff that you're doing in a network, it's going to be one out of four. So if you want to do 10 recruits, right, how many guests do you need? Right? How many? 40. And if you had 40 guests, you would have 10 Good recruits. Okay. Now I'm not saying good quality. I'm just saying good, like they want to try it. If you want to do three recruits a week, okay, which is every week of the month, right? Not three recruits in a week, because that you've done before, but three recruits a week, four months, right? You may not have done that. 30 recruits in a, that's one recruit a day. You have not done that. Then you have to have your interview set up. You got to get in here. You got to have a new work ethic, a new intensity, because you're trying to do something you've never done before. But, you know, when, and, and you know what the best goal you can ever set? What do you think the best goal ever to set is? Now, in your mind, you have a big goal. I want you to have a big goal. Okay. But you know what the best goal you can ever set? Would it be a steady routine? Beat last month. That, that's all I care about. Beat last month. That's the best goal. Now, if you had a bad month last month, beat what you've done in recent months. Okay? That's the absolute 100% best goal you could ever set. Beat last month. OK, because this is what is happening to our full timers. OK, I'm going to set a goal that I have no intention of hitting because I don't even know how to hit. it. I've never done it before. So I, you know, I, I read these books on setting goals. And, and, you know, look, mediocrity is everywhere, including the books and bullshit that you read, too. OK, I look at it all the time. Movies is like, yeah, one out of 10 movies is good. One, you know, even the books like. They're not in this business. You can take good stuff from it, okay? But how you feel about pursuing your goal is everything, right? So you set a goal. It's high because you feel it should be high because, you know, I don't want to set a low goal. It's not about setting a low goal. It's about hitting a goal. It's about putting the work behind understanding what it's like to pursue a real tangible goal. So I'm going to say 20 by 20 or 10 by 10 or 5,000 personal or three by three. But then I don't have any appointment set for the week. I don't have any new people invited to the meeting. I don't come in to set any appointments or do anything. And then I feel frustrated. No, let's start back at the basics. So. You know, as, as we start June, you know, I, I want you to understand how you can hit a goal, right? It's cool to say the goals, man. I trust me. I love it. You know, I love it. I love hearing it, right? And, and, and part of the, I do want you to think a little bit bigger, right? But also I know, hey, man, if you don't have a bunch of people here tomorrow and you don't have lists ready to go and you're not freaking killing yourself to set appointments, man, you're freaking spinning your wheels, you're chasing your own tail and you're lying to yourself. And that's not going to get you anywhere, Right. I remember one of my first breakfast club meetings I ever went to, they said something I had always lived by, right? They said, a full-timer who doesn't work, write this down. A full-timer who does not work steals the dream. You guys have heard me say that many times. A full-timer who does not work steals the dream. I didn't say a full-timer who doesn't get results. That's okay. Not for a long time, but if you work, you will get results. But a full-timer who does not work 
steals the dream. Think about it. There's a dream you stole. It. I live by that. You know, when you, when you don't work here and you don't get yourself going here, you live under a black cloud. Right. I used to always say that in college. Right. I, there was always this cloud following. That's why I hated college so much. Right. Like, you know, I'm, I'm mentally preparing right now because I got to take the 65. Right. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit right there. I'm going to ghost all of you. Um, I'm gonna take it and fail and call you, you know, three months later. I was in a funk. <laughs> that test really, just really did it to me, you know. But I'm mentally preparing because, like, I, you guys know this. Like, my nightmares, my worst nightmares, are in my in my nightmare. I'm in college and I have a test. I thought I graduated, you know. But the real, like, vivid dreams that you have, I'm like in college. Um, but I always felt there was a black cloud always over me because I was never doing my work. And that's what happens in Primerica. When you don't work, you just almost feel like there's this cloud over you. Just like you can never shake it. Right? You know, look, it's okay to not hit your goal. It's okay to not get results. But if you work, you at least feel good about yourself. Right? And so you guys know I'm I'm I, I'm not a fitness enthusiast enthusiast, but I like fitness. I do. I like I enjoy it a lot, right? So I was off for the most part for a month. Okay, and let me just give you this little story real quick before we start going into the prospect and stuff that we're going to talk about, okay? Because I think this is important. So I was off for a whole month, okay? I was working out at home, but that was nothing. Staring at the mirror all day. <laughs> Kids are running down during a set. You just drop the weight or whatever. It was just I was just trying to get, not have muscle atrophy from being off for a month, right? So, because my gym is, it's for real. Like, it's, it's you know, Louise knows you know, he came, he quit, never came back, right? Uh, Donald, I'll get you. Donald didn't even show up. That one. <laughs> Alex, yeah. Alex threw up, he came to my gym, right? And Alex is a good athlete. Josh knows what I'm talking about. Lock him up. Uh, so my gym is for real. Like, it's not like, like, you know, I, like I joke with you guys. I'm like, I go with, but, but the girls in my gym are for real. Okay, they are for real. So like, you know, so Tamir and Samir, is, he's more disciplined than me about it. Okay. And so we're off for a whole month, and then we're like, all right, man, when are we going to go? When are we going to go? When are we going to go? And then we're putting it up. Well, today's Eve. I ate. It was oily food. No. <laughs> and the next day, and I'm like, all right, man, let's just go. So we just talk each other into going. Okay. We didn't want to go. We made every excuse. But you know what? Once you step in the gym, your perspective changes. Yeah. Once you take that first step, your view changes. When you're sitting there thinking about it, pondering about it, the excuses come, the black cloud comes, you're afraid of lying to yourself, oh, it's only 12 hours later. But once you step in and you see it and you feel it and you're right, right when I walked up, right? And that was a, it was a mistake. I should not have gone, okay? Because <laughs> I probably should have taken a couple more days off, okay? And I'm feeling it today. But once I walk in, I see the people walking in. I saw Samir, my friend, in there. I was like, all right, man, what are we going to do, right? And you go in and you pick your barbell up and you hear the music and the coach says, hey, man, how are you? You see other people. What's going on? You're like, all right, man, I'm here. Your perspective changes, right? I know. I know, man. I love I love working out. I really do. I love it. It makes me feel good. I, I tell people all the time, it saves me thousands of dollars of therapy all, every single month, right? Love in there, throwing the weight around. I enjoy it. But I made it see I was off for 30 days, right? Wasn't wasn't feeling extremely confident making it. And this is just small, right? I understand you haven't made a call. It goes wrong. This, that, what's going to happen? Projection. I'm not confident. All that stuff. And I, I don't mean to tease you. But I know that that's what happens. But once you make that first step, once you make that first call, once you get your butt into the office, once you overcome your challenge, right? A little bit. Your whole perspective changes, man. And it's funny, I was thinking about it, like literally, it's just so funny the mind, man. I think I'm pretty good about stuff. But I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Should we, should we go? Should we go? And then we finally go. And then it's like, all right, man, now we're back in the all right, man. I'm in my element again. Let's get back right right to it, right? It's, it's, it's totally normal to always fear and doubt yourself. That's totally normal. But you just getting yourself to do the freaking work, that's what's gonna build your confidence. All right. So um, you know. Laziness 
and procrastination turns you into a victim. And you let it happen. Okay, I'm not talking about real issues. Some, right? Some people have real issues. And you let that happen. Okay. So, talk about recruiting. Okay. Um, and prospecting. Okay. And I don't care. When I say prospecting, I don't care how you're getting these meetings. Okay. It could be 100%. Like yesterday, I did a meeting um, with my brother uh, for a business that has 16 employees. And it was a business meeting. Like, we're trying to set up a business plan for them. That's cool, right? It was still another meeting that I had. The the entryway was a business. It was a 401k or a simple IRA or a payroll deduction IRA plan. But I don't know if it's appropriate for the business, but the person that we met with would be an unbelievable slam dunk recruit, right? So all I care about is you getting in front of people, okay? What you do with those people and how you navigate through that is up to you. Okay. Me personally, I, you guys know, I called people three hours a day. And then at night, if I wasn't on appointments, I went and met neighbors. I went out and I surveyed people and I did that. And I carry my little FNA with me and I would do surveys and I would do it two, three hours a day, five, six days a week. If I didn't have appointments and I did that for three years and then that's how I have what I have. Right. And it's funny. Um, Sheldon was in here. You guys remember Sheldon, right? You remember Sheldon? Who remembers Sheldon? Right, Sheldon was in here. Sheldon um, came and he, he he was one of our tech guys, right? And he would do he always recorded audios, right? And so I was texting with him and I was like, uh, you know, Samir was like, hey, you know, remember Sheldon has all the audios? Can you ask him for? So I reached out to him. And I was like, hey, do you have any audios? And he said he had a few, right? And uh, so he did have like 10 or 11 from my full time meeting on Friday. I would give them to you, but they're just way too explicit. Okay? <laughs> it's like an uncensored NWA album. <laughs> like, it's just not ready for mainstream. Okay. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's just like the airwaves are just not ready. <laughs> but one of the audios on there was for my RVP promotion. That was the, the training we had when I got promoted to RVP. Okay. And, you know, so you listen to audio and you're li literally going in a time machine. <laughs> right. And I'm listening to myself. My like, geez, what? I mean, just yelling, spitting crazy. Okay. I'm like, turn this thing off, throw this out the window. You know, I, I think my kids were partly in the car. And like, who is that? Like, That's your dad. <laughs> I was a shell of himself, you know, now I'm a shell of myself, but the, the numbers were there, right? And that month that I went to RVP and I was talking about it, okay, we promoted 11 districts in one month, not direct to me, in my team, 11 districts promoted one month, right? And I talked about full time in there, Right? And I said, I have seven full timers here direct to me that are fully licensed. Not I have seven full timers. I have seven full timers here in the room that are fully licensed. Think of how many fully licensed. This is as a regional leader, not an SRL, a regional leader. Seven direct full time. This is before RVP. District leaders and above full time that are fully licensed. Why am I saying this? Is there a fixed point? Yeah. That was my schedule that led to that. Right. And that was within three years. Not chasing a title. Right? Not chasing a title. Title didn't save me. Chasing being good, a professional, not an amateur, learning, correcting my mistakes, getting really wide. I was 14 wide having a plan right so it's not who you recruit it's who you keep
If you want to be a great recruiter, don't play for the quitters and don't let these duds turn you into a dud. Okay? Who cares if they quit? If you could have done something different, awesome. If you could have made an adjustment, people quit, that's okay. We play for the stayers, man. I worry about the people that show up. I worry about the people that sign up. I, I worry about the people that come to the convention, that come to the big event, that go out in the field, that get their license, that take it two or three times. I don't play for the people that quit. You know, sitting here strategizing on how Shondell could have gotten more out of her, whatever the number was, 27 directs in three months, and how to get more. No, I don't care about that. I care, hey, can we do something with the 27 that we have? See success. What keeps recruits if they see success fast? When recruits succeed, they stay. Okay. What is success? A good appointment. A recruit. Passing the exam. A successful setting appointment. Making a phone call. Conducting an interview. Progressing towards their bonus. Spend time with recruits. Look, man, you know, I know, I know, it, you know, as you get here and you've been here for a little bit, right, like me, you start to, it's it's very natural. You start to get a little bitter. You start to get too smart at the business. Oh, people quit. Oh, this. Or they've been, bur I, they've burned me before. Don't give up on people, man. You need a handful. You can change the whole world, man. One guy, one girl, one couple can change your whole freaking thing. You know, hey, I love Hector Lamar, right? I mean, I, I'm, I, I like I like Hector. All right? I mean, I don't pay. If you can hear in his thing, man. He was doing nothing till he recruited Rick Stewart. He's at 80 grand of income. And they recruited his, Rick Susie. His income went to 500000 If he didn't recruit Rick Susie, you wouldn't even know Hector Lamar. I'm being honest. Right? Now, he, he had to follow up with Rick Susie. He deserves that. And then when he recruited that one person, he got confident. He made 500. Then he got Chris Howard and all that. All those other people, right? One recruit, man. So you cannot give up, man. You're looking for that winning lottery ticket. Spend time with recruits, right? Don't give up. You know, your recruits, they got to become your family, man. Become a pro. No one wants to work with an amateur, okay? An amateur does not get paid. A pro knows what to do, when to do it, whether they want to do it or not. Okay. So, it's not about perfection. It's about prospecting. Hesitation will kill you. Now, I, uh, I, I'm signing my kids up for swim team. Right? So, I called... Uh, this morning, I was actually out on the phone, and I was talking to this lady, and I was like, oh, hey, so look, my, my kids, they can swim. They're really good at swimming, but they don't like swimming laps. You know, I like to run, but running track is a different animal, right? When you're running in practice, like I ran winter track just to stay in shape for soccer, right? But like, you know, I went to go, right? And, and I don't know how my your school did. My school did. Like if you were in the top three or five, then you represented the school for the meet. So I was like number 20, you know what I mean? I, I'm fast for like 10 or 15 yards, but like 55, 200, 300, I'm getting burned, okay? So, but I would go run and I would go, and I, you'd see the fast people and you'd see how they run and they would, I mean, they would do the stretches, the dynamic stretch and you see them and the, they were freaking fast, right? So I told them, I was like, look, my kids can swim. They can cannonball, but I don't know if they can swim laps. And they go, well, you know, but I go, but my son, he sees his friends doing it. He wants to do it. And I'm going to put him in. I just wanted to see, like, I want him to have fun. And I also don't want to put him in a position where he's going to fail. And so she was just like, all right. And I said, so tell me, like, what's the commitment? What's this? What's that? What is it? Right. So it's like a couple hundred bucks and they swim every day. And, and then at seven in the morning, I was like, seven in the morning. Damn. Like, my, my son's, he's not. <laughs> and my daughter's six, she's going to be seven. And you know what the coach said to me? He goes, well, we find if we don't do it first thing in the morning, 
the excuses just start coming and they won't do it. I was like, yeah, you're right. Because if I can get my kids up at seven in the morning, jump in a freaking cold pool, they're going to be a little group be- a little better prepared for at life. Okay. So I said, all right. And you you guys know what I do with my kids, right? It's like, so I asked my son, I was like, look, you can do it, but we're going to finish it. Okay. You can do it. But if we sign up, it's not about the money. You're going to finish what you start. It's six, seven weeks, not an eternity, but you're going to go. You're going to go every day and we're going to finish. And my son's like, all right, let's do it. I was like, all right, let's do it. I'm cool. I, I don't care. I'll wake up. Hey, I'm a supportive parent. I'm not going to jump in the pool with you. But, you know, I'll be there in spirit. Okay. But I'll go with you. But if this is what you want to do, you got to do it. And I did swim team when I was younger, right? And I learned my lesson. I never did it freaking again. Okay. <laughs> that's why I have a pool. I'll never go in a pool full of water at seven in the morning. It's just like, I'd rather, let me sleep in a freezer. Okay. That's better for me, you know. But the longer you wait, the more excuses you'll think of. This is for everybody. If you're not growing your business, you know you're making excuses. You're not recruiting people. You're not putting activity in. You're waiting, waiting, waiting. And your, your excuses become more elaborate. You're letting that black cloud get bigger and bigger. Right? Take your first step. Change your perspective, man. And do it first thing in the morning. That's what I do. Right? You know, there's a lot of business networking meetings. They meet at what time? Seven o'clock in the morning. You can still go to work. Right. You have to have a can do something will happen. Anything is possible attitude, man. You know, if I got freaking this is this is a this is a community team. And she goes, I just want you to also understand our team is not that competitive. And I go and I go, what do you mean? She goes, no, no, no. We have a couple people that qualify for all stars. I was like, well, tell me more. She was like, you know, but some some of the swim teams in Ashburg, she goes, they recruit. I was like, damn, for real? Like, yeah, they or they bar other neighborhoods or they're really competitive. They try out. They do it. We let everybody come. We're just trying to teach them life skills. That's what I like. I, don't, I mean, I told us my son's nine. If he gets it, he gets it. He wants to play at the next level. That's cool. I'll put him in something better. But, hey, waking up in the morning early, doing something, freaking getting out of your comfort zone, going, being with your teammates, doing that's freaking life skills, man. That's why I want to do it. I can put them in a little camp where you go around and they serve you pizza and they dig carry you. No, we're freaking doing swim team. If you want to do it, you're going to do it. Let's do it. Right? I mean, what, what about your life skills? What are you doing in the morning? You Look, I know your job is literally trying to zombie you, World War Z you right now. Wake up tired. All I can do is work. Think, no, you got to get out of that. And if you got to have your job, have your job. But this is your one shot for freaking greatness, man. And I'm not going to apologize for how hard it is that you got to work. Because the work is what makes this opportunity great. Start while enthusiasm is high. Always remember, when, like at the beginning of the month, after a convention, there's a shelf life on enthusiasm. And excitement. It will go away if you do not fan that flame and you start something, making a call, getting out of your comfort zone. Overdue prospecting. I gave you minimums to do. Set five interviews a day. Right. I'm going to go over a schedule that we, we showed a video about that you can do. Right. That some of you guys are doing. You can do this. That's. You know, overdo it, though. Don't underdo it. Overdo it. A no today, maybe a yes tomorrow. Don't take it personally. Always remember this. If you hear the most no's, you'll hear the most yeses. It's not about eliminating no. It's about getting yes more. And the person that hears no the most, they hear yes the most. Right? See, sometimes you're only focused on the yes. I want to hear yes more. Then you got to hear no more. That's the way that this business works. One thing I always said, okay, there's two things I always live by, right? One, whenever I would go through crap, I'd always say, this is why I'm going to make a lot of money, right? And second, I'd always say, they all can't say no. 